Welcome to the SPE Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Mark McLean. I'm a partner with the consulting firm of Rose and Associates. And I am honored to be here today to talk with you about a subject that has generated a considerable amount of interest globally, both inside and outside of our industry. Reserve overbooking as an issue of professional ethics. And I greatly appreciate your being here and your attending this session. Over the course of my professional career, I have been blessed and have had the privilege of meeting with and working with a number of people literally from around the world. And I am indebted to so many who have patiently taught and mentored me and invested a part of themselves in me. One of the things I enjoy the most about what I do now professionally are the opportunities I have to invest in others, to pass on what I have learned for their benefit. And that is what I hope to do today in this presentation. When speaking about a subject like reserve overbooking, particularly as it relates to, to ethics, I am reminded of that, that old parable that goes something like this. He who lives in a glass house should be careful when throwing rocks. When my partner Pete Rose and I first wrote about reserve overbooking in a paper for the 2001 Hydrocarbon Economics and Evaluation Symposium in Dallas, it truly was a subject very few people wanted to talk about publicly. Indeed, the title of the paper was Reserve Overbooking, the Problem No One Wants to Talk About. Pete and I had no idea at the time what would transpire in our industry in inter intervening years. Do I believe that reserve overbooking is a serious problem for our industry? And I'm asked that question a lot. In general, I would have to say no, but it has certainly become a very public problem. And because of that, it is something that we as professionals would be wise to pay attention to. My hope today is to stir your thinking and to engage you in the process of collectively us as an industry, professional societies, and even government come up with consistent and workable solutions. And I must say that for the most part, I am encouraged by the emerging professional debate within our industry. I have learned sometimes to my surprise that people often have different views about what words mean. So it may be helpful for us to start with the definition of the word ethics, so that at least we can start with a common reference point. Ethics may be defined as the discipline of dealing with what is good and bad and with moral duty and obligation, a set of moral principles or values, a theory or system of moral values, the principles of conduct governing an individual or a group. You'll see in that definition some common themes and words that are woven through it. Ethics, however, may also be viewed as a framework for discerning between right and wrong. But sometimes we run into situations where there is no clear right and wrong. Ethics then becomes a process for helping us choose between options that may equally be perceived to be right. We live today in what I will call the post-Enron world. Now, what happened at Enron and Tyco and WorldCom and more importantly, what lessons can you and I derive from it? Well, in some form or fashion, here's how I would describe what happened. It appears that certain people put what was good for them, put their personal gain above those for whom they were in place to represent and serve, that is the shareholders. And for us, in spite of the increased financial and regulatory scrutiny that our industry is, is under, reserve overbooking remains a persistent and now public problem. It is not a technology issue. It is a people issue, often with strong ethical components. And for an industry that has made enormous technical advances over the last decade or two, it is the softer aspects of this particular issue that I believe are going to be the most challenging for us. So as we go forward, think about how reserve overbooking relates to this whole broad issue of professional ethics. To begin with, let's define what I mean by reserve overbooking. Reserve overbooking, simply stated, may be defined as reporting more oil and gas reserves on the company books than could be justified, allowed, or permitted following the governing reserve reporting standards. Reserve overbooking is widely acknowledged and has been for a number of years in our industry. At the same time, it was a taboo. A taboo is a subject everyone knows about, but no one wants to talk about. Reserve overbooking has multiple causes. I'm going to distill them down to two broad categories in a moment. It is also an issue that will not simply go away. 
This last one is particularly insidious because we often won't know until many years later whether we have a problem. This is one of the many differences I've discovered in my own career as a drilling engineer and as a reservoir engineer. Drilling provides often rapid feedback. You'll know fairly quickly if you've made some errors or mistakes. Feedback from the reservoir often takes years, and by then those responsible for knowingly overbooking may be long gone. Reserve estimating, like all estimating, is subjective, and I think we sometimes forget that. There's a huge amount of uncertainty when it comes to our side of the business, particularly in the, in the upstream. Reserve estimating depends on analysis of uncertain data to arrive at a projection of some future economic recovery. As you know, the reserve reporting standards and guidelines for companies whose stock is publicly traded in the United States are defined by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And although these guidelines are specifically deterministic in nature, that is, they are a single number, they are still nonetheless estimates and rely on the subjective professional judgment of the individuals making them. So why are reserve estimates so important? Well, they are important because they are used externally by potential investors as an indicator of underlying asset value. People making decisions about whether they're going to invest in your company or mine or in my project or yours will look at the reserve estimates as some indicator of the underlying asset value. Secondly, reserve estimates are used internally for a number of purposes within companies. Project valuations, contract and unitization agreements, project funding, approval, regulatory reporting, and corporate strategic planning. This is a short list of the uses for reserve estimates. So you can see that it's important for me to be as objective and unbiased as possible because there are a lot of decisions that ride on the estimates that we make. For a sense of perspective, I'd like to take a look at proved reserve booking changes that occurred in the last half of the 1990s. This chart shows reserve changes that occurred for a number of companies. Each bar represents a single company that occurred from 1996 through the year 2000 divided by the year 2000. So it is a percent change over that 5,000 five-year period represented by the year 2000 as a benchmark. What we find are a series of revisions, both negative and positive, to prove producing reserves for U.S. producing properties. These are reserves that, according to the SEC reserve classification system, ought to have a high degree of confidence that you will meet or exceed those reserve levels. And yet we see large increases on the far right, which represents, I believe, some inherent conservatism in those companies. But we also see on the far left of this chart something that is really destructive and damaging, large write-downs of proved producing reserves. The bar on the far left with the 60 percent write-down over this five-year period is absolutely devastating to the investors of that company because that company no longer exists. So estimating bias is a problem. For companies in the middle of this chart, within plus or minus 10 percent, I would say there's no systematic problem. But when you have conservatism on the far right and you have optimism on the far left that ultimately reserve, re, result in changing reserves, you ill serve the investor. Now, reserve overestimating can and does occur throughout the life of an asset, all the way from the base analysis, which is the feedstock to exploration, all the way through discovery and ultimately to depletion and abandonment. We have mergers and acquisitions that take place across the full spectrum of this. Reserve overbooking can and does occur any time from start of production through depletion. Mergers and acquisitions are very vulnerable to the mistakes either intentional or not, of reserve overbooking because you often won't know if an asset that you've acquired has been overbooked or overestimated until sometime after you have purchased it. Now, at this point, I think it may be helpful for me to share with you a premise that influences my thinking considerably. I'll be completely candid with you. I did not always think this way, and it was certainly not something that I was taught in college. Simply stated, it is my view that those of us that work for somebody else, and I think that includes just about everyone, are not merely employees but are, in fact, the stewards of the owner's assets, the owners being the shareholders. We were hired to serve the best interest of the shareholders. 
And in light of this, what is wrong with reserve overbooking? But to begin with, it creates what I'll call ethical tension because it conflicts with objectivity and therefore one of the tenets of professionalism as I'll develop later on. It also can be destructive to companies externally and internally. Externally because it leads shareholders potentially to make investments that they might otherwise not have made. People making investments rely on the information in company records to help them guide those decisions. If reserves are overstated, investors may make investments they otherwise might not have made had they had objective, unbiased information. If reserves are written down, therefore, it potentially has and, and can destroy the value of those people making those investments. So it's destructive externally, potentially. Reserve overbooking can also be very destructive internally to companies in that it creates intense organizational stress. Companies in which there is a lot of pressure applied to employees to aggressively book reserves or resistance to debook when necessary create internal stress that is often very damaging not only to the individuals involved but also to the organization. At the risk of oversimplifying, I'd like to describe two broad categories of reserve overbooking. I'll call these errors of omission and errors of commission, and let's look at these one at a time. Errors of omission are unintentional and result largely from ignorance and poor estimating skills. Now, this ignorance and poor estimating skills may be inadvertent. It may actually be willful, and they may be further compounded by a number of estimating biases that affect us as human beings. It's interesting. I use the term willful. Can, I can have a hard time imagining people choosing not to learn a better way, but I, my, if I look deep into myself, I know that I'm comfortable often with ways I've done things in the past. And many people find themselves in this position, that they're used to the old ways, particularly a deterministic view of estimating. And so when we think about estimating dealing with uncertainty through ranges, it's a way that is uncomfortable to them. So oftentimes this willful resistance comes from the fact that I like the results the way I've gotten them before. Now, in his classic paper, The Difficulty of Assessing Uncertainty, Ed Capon concluded that people in general are poor estimators, but we can learn and we can improve. So how do we learn? Well, we learn through education and training, learning how to estimate systematically and consistently to remove bias from our estimates. We can learn through mentoring which provides feedback. This is one of the great tragedies, I believe, in our industry the last 25 years that I've been in it, with the loss of the mentors. When I hired on in 1980 with the company that I started with in the drilling group, I had a number of people that I worked with that had been with the company 20 to 30 years. And they took someone who was very young, very brash and very arrogant and very confident, overly so, showed me that I didn't know nearly as much as I thought I did. I'm indebted to these people because they helped me navigate through some turbulent early waters in my career. Unfortunately, these people are largely gone from our industry now. So one of the challenges facing us is going to be replacing what they gave to people that are in the industry now. And finally, portfolio monitoring. Portfolio monitoring is taking our portfolio and as a group looking at our estimates before and after. Taking our estimates, comparing them with our results. Is that is how I identify bias on a portfolio basis. Now, just how much rides on our estimates anyway? Why is this so important? Well, in the year 2000, the total amount of upstream capital spent worldwide among publicly traded E&P companies was around 140 billion U.S. dollars. In other words, the shareholders of these companies invested 140 billion dollars for exploration, development, and property acquisition projects based solely, totally, and entirely on the estimates of the technical staff working for them. So learning how to estimate is absolutely vital. Errors of commission are those errors we know about, either beforehand or at some point in the future, and fall into two general categories. The first one is what I call in intentional overbooking due to misguided incentives. Now, these incentives may take different forms, such as bonuses, stock options, promotions, or simply the joy of selling the deal. The problem with these type of systems is who benefits from them? 
because it oftentimes sets up a conflict between what's good for me as a person versus what's good for the shareholder. In my opinion, any reward system that puts what's good for me personally above the people I was hired to serve, that is to shareholders, has problems associated with it. The second category of, of errors of commission is what I call ignoring unambiguous reserve overbooking. This is the situation we find ourselves in when we know we're overbooked. We can't justify it. We can't rationalize it. It is undeniable. At that point, what do you and I as professionals do? I'd like to take a look at these each in a little bit more detail. The great Greek philosopher Plato said it very well, what is honored in a country is cultivated there. Another way of looking at this is simply what gets rewarded gets done. Now, this principle works for pets, it works for children, it works for adults. We basically do what we are rewarded for doing or perceive ourselves to be rewarded for doing. So how might this look? Well, let's take a look at a fictional company called Big Rock Oil Company. Big Rock's management has decided that they want to increase reserves, and they have chosen drilling wells as the way to do so. And they recognize that people often will do what they're rewarded for doing, so they've set up the following incentive structure. Bonuses for meeting certain targets, but they realize that they heard somewhere that you need to apply a little stick as well. And so the stick is, if you don't meet these certain targets, you might lose your job. The question I ask you as the advisors to this management group is, what should this management group expect to see based on this reward structure? The answer is, they will get lots of wells. But the question for the investor is, will they add value? See, it may not matter to the staff, they got their bonuses, but it sure matters to the shareholders and to the investor. Well, I'd like to now move to the second um, example, and that is the ignoring unambiguous overbooking. And I'd like to put us all in the hot seat for just a moment. Here's a situation taken from the western part of the United States where I have a gas field that has been developed in 160 acres spacing. The wells go off the map in all directions from the one I have on this slide. We happen to have picked up some undeveloped acreage in the heart of this field and are getting ready to drill these wells. We've decided based on the statutory spacing and based on early work that was done by wells drilled around us that we're going to book reserves as we drill these wells based on a 160 acre drainage program. So we go through and we drill the program and everything is fine until about four years later. And we start looking at well performance and notice some, some problems and we actually go out and collect some data and do some analysis that shows that these wells are not draining 160 acres. They are draining only between 90 and 120 acres. We booked them on 160 acres, but now we're in a quandary. What do we do here? What would you do in this situation? Would you go ahead and write down the reserve now Make that adjustment based on what you know at this point, or would you wait and hope? Hope for a miracle. Hope for a transfer. Hope for someone to come along and buy the field. That way it becomes their problem. Well, why is there often so much reluctance and hand-wringing associated with writing down reserves? Well, it is because for publicly traded companies, the market impacts can be quite negative at least in the near term. But as last year so vividly pointed out, the light of day has shown that ultimately you have to pay the piper. Unfortunately, it is the shareholder who often suffers the most. Now, this is a challenge for which I mentioned early on, technology is not the answer. But fortunately, there is a solution, and I'd like to offer a threefold combination of leadership, education, and professionalism. These can be thought of as a three-legged stool. All of them are necessary in order for us to remain seated in the stool and not on the ground. As with most human organizations, companies tend to go where the leaders take them. So the first ingredient is leadership. If you are in a position of leadership, I encourage you to go ahead and embrace the fact that people are looking at you to set the tone, to set the example. So lead by example. In so doing, have clearly stated expectations and standards that you yourself are, being, are willing to be held accountable to. 
There are few things that are more demoralizing and destructive in organizations than for the existence of or the perception of dual standards. One system for the executives, one system for the staff. Have standards that you yourself are willing to be held accountable to. The third ingredient I would encourage you to do if you're in a position of leadership and influence is to critically evaluate your incentive and reward systems and begin by asking a couple of questions. What are we rewarding? In our structure, what are we rewarding? Are we rewarding activity, which is what Big Rock Oil was doing, or are we rewarding value creation? Another question to ask is a little bit of soul searching is do we like the results that we are getting? Because if we don't, we need to then ask, how are we rewarding what we're getting? Because it, we recognize people generally do what they're rewarded for doing. There are two principles, I think, that are good to help us think about this. The first one is this. If the company prospers, we all prosper. A good metaphor for this, I think, is the game of tug of war, where you have teams competing on two ends of the rope pulling against each other. The objective gets the other team into the mud pit that usually separates you. I have found that it's much better if the people on my team are pulling the same direction I am. I'm much less likely to end up in the mud pit because that's usually where I was placed on the front of the line. So we need to be pulling on the same end of the rope. Secondly, have a system that places shareholder value above personal gain. Now, you'll notice I did not say eliminate personal gain. I'm not that altruistic. I understand what motivates people, but there must be a hierarchy that recognizes that I, as an employee, am here to serve the owners. So what's good for them has to be above, in my opinion, what's good for me personally. By the way, these principles are not limited to those people who have the title or role or responsibility of manager. The second ingredient is education. And again, this is applies to all of us regardless of our position in our companies. You see, our education did not end when we received our academic degree. In many cases, that's when it really began. Not much comfort to my children who are looking forward to getting out of school, but those of us who are beyond that recognize that for us to really succeed and grow as professionals and individuals requires that we become what I call lifelong learners. Well, if you'd like to do this, I have three things I'd like to suggest for you to focus on. The first one is, if you don't know how to already, learn how to estimate under uncertainty using systematic and probabilistic estimating methods. These methods have been around in our industry for almost 30 years and have been involved very deeply in the exploration side of our business, not as widely applied in the production or development side. But learn how to deal with uncertainty through estimating in ranges. Estimating with a single value, the determinism, is always going to give you a wrong answer. And the key flaw in deterministic estimates also is that it implies that you know more than you actually do. Secondly, I encourage you to understand the effect that bias has on decision making. There's a phrase that I often use that bias is the mortal enemy of portfolio management. Bias being a systematic tendency toward conservatism or optimism will absolutely destroy your company's ability to manage a portfolio. And yet companies invest millions of dollars and countless man hours investing time trying to optimize and manage their portfolio. Yet all that effort and money is wasted if all the assets that go into that portfolio are inconsistently evaluated with different levels of estimating bias. Finally, learn how to critically evaluate past performance. Past performance is what I call performance tracking, taking my estimates and comparing them with my results so that I can learn from them. You have probably heard the phrase that practice makes perfect. Actually, practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. It is evaluated practice that leads to real improvement. So the goal here is to learn from our past, not to blame, but to learn. The third ingredient is professionalism. This is another term that I have learned means different things to different people. And for a long time, I assumed that the definition of a professional is clearly obvious. But I've spent a fair bit of time discussing what this means with a number of my colleagues in the industry, and I'd like to distill it down to these four elements. Number one, a professional is guided by values and principles, not circumstances. These values and principles are immutable. That means they don't change with time or circumstances. 
If you don't have a set of values or principles that guide you, you will be much like a large sailing vessel without a rudder on the open ocean. You'll simply be driven wherever the wind and waves take you. Secondly, a professional accepts personal responsibility and accountability and recognizes that they have fiduciary responsibility to the owners. Third, a professional places long-term shareholder value above his or her personal gain. And number four, a professional is fair and objective. I'm sure many of you have had the experience that I've had in your career. Part of what makes us good and professional is we get involved in our work. But sometimes we get emotionally involved in our work and, and it clouds our, obj our objectivity and our judgment. One project I remember vividly about 10 years ago was a new field development which we had a lot of fun, working, drilling wells, coring wells, running logs I had never heard of before. Then one day we got a message from headquarters saying that we were going to sell the field. My response was, you, you can't sell my field. I'm having too much fun. It clearly clouded my judgment because in retrospect, I think we drilled a well or two too many. It would have been much better for us at that point when we had a lot of interest in the field to have sold the field. It would have benefited the, the shareholders. One of the things I found about being emotionally involved or attached to our projects is that no project I've ever loved ever loved me back. And more importantly, it clouded my judgment. We have a lot of rules, procedures, policies, guidelines that regulate the definition of and booking of proved reserves of oil and gas in our industry. However, the highly publicized write-downs announced last year have, among other things, exposed some inconsistency between these standards. Consistent agreed upon standards will clearly be an improvement. I like the way that Jim Ross described all of this in, a, in an article he wrote for the 19, in 1998 for the journal Petroleum Technology, in which he stated, unless the regulatory bodies also adopt these guidelines, and he was referring to the 1997 reserve classification guidelines recommended by the SPE and the World Petroleum Congress. Unless the regulatory bodies also adopt these guidelines or improve their existing ones, major inconsistencies will remain a significant problem for the industry. I don't think Jim had any idea in 1998 what would transpire four, five, and six years after he penned these words. So how are all of these controls, procedures, and policies working? amazingly well, for the most part, with room as noted for improvement. And I think that that is something the industry and our society is going to have to really address. But let me ask you a question. What if we had the perfect system? What if we, through a lot of negotiation and work, came up with a system that every industry group, every society, every company, every regulatory agency in the world agreed as a way to define approved reserves of oil and gas. Is that the answer? Is that perfect system the answer? I'm certainly not a, an expert at all about what went on with Enron, but I have learned to take what I read and see in the media with a grain of salt. But I am fairly confident that there were at the time rules, procedures, policies, regulations, and laws in place that were designed to prevent exactly what happened. So what happened? People just chose to ignore them and walk around them. See, it's my belief that ultimately compliance with any laws, rules, policies, procedures becomes an issue of ethics, an, eth an issue of personal and corporate values and character. We make choices based on what we value. All my experience has shown that someone that has a good sense of right and wrong occasionally just needs a little reminder much like the radar trailers that many police departments in the United States used to set up a neighborhood just to remind drivers just how fast they're going. Well, I'd like to leave us as companies and individuals with some challenges. As companies, number one, I encourage every company out there to, to, to define what they mean by professional and then begin to encourage and reward professional behavior within their organization. Number two, find and develop mentors. This may take a little bit of work, but the generation that's coming out of the colleges and universities today is in desperate need of people to, with experience to guide them in the beginning of their careers. Find those people who have a heart of a teacher who want to develop in others and to 
encourage them to be mentored. And number three, find a way to resolve ethical issues. The fact that we're dealing with other human beings means we're going to have some conflict from time to time. And people are going to run into situations that they're going to have questions about. There are two ways that we've thought of to do this. One is to have an independent reserve committee within your company that handles issues where people are concerned and have confusion about what they're being asked to do or perceive they're being asked to do. A second way to deal with this is to establish a position of a company advocate or ombudsman. This person would have the ear of senior management and the respect of younger professional staff. Someone who finds themselves in what they perceive to be an ethical dilemma could then go to this ombudsman. And the ombudsman then has the opportunity to listen to the story, if you will, and then do some research and come back to that young professional and say, this is not an ethical dilemma and here's why. So mentoring takes place. But if there is an ethical problem, that ombudsman then goes to the managers, therefore protecting the young professional. So he then becomes the advocate to get things addressed in a professional manner. Now, for us as individuals, I'd like to leave us with some challenges. Number one, take personal responsibility for our choices, our careers, and our actions. Number two, be willing to learn. Adopt the philosophy of being a lifelong learner. And number three, deal with issues and differences professionally. Again, we as human beings are going to have disagreements. But we can deal with them straight up, and we can deal with them professionally. And what I've found is that it takes dealing with things on, based on facts and not our opinions. It also takes a little bit of humility. There are four words that I have used a lot in dealing with my family and in dealing with my colleagues in our industry, and they are these. I might be wrong. Dealing with other people from that perspective helps diffuse a lot of issues. That's something we as individuals can do. One of the realities facing us in our industry is that there are going to be some changes with respect to reserve reporting and accountability. I don't know what these changes will ultimately be, although I know many of the ideas that are being debated. But the extent to which you and I can professionally influence these changes and then diligently comply with both their letter and spirit will benefit all of us, the shareholders and those of us that work for them. Thank you very much.